So we're gonna to start today with Susan Landgraf. She was awarded a Poets Laureate Grant from the Academy of American Poets in 2020. To Sylvia's Press published The Inspired Poet, a poetry writing book of prompts with poems from 69 poets in 2019. More than 400 poems have appeared in Prairie Schooner, Poet Lore, Margie, Nimrod, and many others. Other books include What We Bury Changes the Ground and Other Voices. She taught at Highline College for 30 years and at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. She's given more than 150 workshops most recently at the Port Townsend Writers Conference and served as Poet Laureate of Auburn, Washington from 2018 to 2020. Susan, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm gonna to give you the floor. Really looking forward to your reading. Thank you so much. I am so delighted to be here. Um, I want to thank you, Sheila, and also Holly and Linda and George for making this happen and to be able to read with the amazing Kelly Agadon. Thank you, Kel. It's been a great day for many reasons, this reading for one. I'm going to be reading the first three poems from the uh, book, What We Bury Changes the Ground. I've had my child a dream of traveling come true all these many years after dreaming of, as a child of traveling around the world. Uh, Botswana and the Mahadi Hadi pans sleeping under the stars, China and the amazing Magao caves in Duan Hong. So many more places in the world, so many amazing experiences, including Greece and Santorini where I cried when I first visited because it felt like I'd been there before and was coming home. This one is about Greece. It's titled After the Oracle at Delphi. Men, hands poised mid-move, deliberate over chessboards in front of the cafe. Women sweep out their doorways. Hundred degree sun bleaches columns spilled over the countryside. Fields filled with sounds of cicadas and raspy grasses. After dark, the air smells of olives and heat, and star after star after star falls into a chasm next to the taverna. It's spring, and it's that time of year. So, in their honor, this poem is about frogs. It's called Amphibiously. Come January, they will be waiting in their living tombs of mud. Fast-handed kids with no fear of murky caches can catch them, a trace of our primordial climb. Cold-blooded, one frog made this audacious deal with a princess. She couldn't take him for what he was, not a snowy egret with undulating neck or the mighty mythical salmon thrashing upstream to his death. Just frogs with fast tongues and catapults unexpected from such dull lumps. Each spring, their symphony of sexual longing, a surprise. I'm going to change gears just a little bit. Um, this next poem is about place. I grew up in Ohio, um, most, a lot of time in Painesville and Perry and Fairport, Ohio, about 35 miles from Cleveland. My uncle worked for the Chromate, making chrome bumpers for cars. My birth father and mother, and the man who became my stepfather later, worked for the Diamond Alkali. This poem is about my birth father and that place. It's called Land of Alkali and Chromate. Erie, with its dead fish in the 50s, the Cuyahoga River burned. Air filled with chartreuse particles, and the air wore a witch's lip around ponds of sulfur, salt, a burbling gray soup waiting for my father to fall into. He'd grabbed at the slippery sides in the dark, muck sucking his shoes off. When he finally crawled out, his clothes were set like concrete. The doctor said, being drunk 
probably saved him. Today, the river's clean. Erie's got herons and fish. Diamond's been turned into high ceiling apartments and the chromate's been razzed by men in protective clothing. The land lies under new grass, fenced. It will take a hundred years for the ground to grow clean. Across the railroad tracks, weeds go around the headstones. This next poem is also about place. Many of you have been there, Copalis, Pacific Beach, Mo Clips, and the Tohola Indian Reservation. This is one of the longest poems I've written, and it's about a place I've been to many times, some for several weeks at a time. And some of you have been there even longer and stayed longer. It's in sections. I'll say each section by its number. The title of the whole piece is Stories from the Cliff Predicted to Fall into the Sea, A Brief History. One, Beaver Creek has a bed. Water flows over a litany of polished stones under the crisscrossed web of rotted tree bones and channels sand to the sea. Two, a few tourists find their way to the Tohola Reservation at the tip of the Northwest. They buy a bag of chips, maybe some gas, head south in a th thunderstorm. Three, the way the college professor tells it, you can have gold-plated silverware, fresh roasted coffee in china cups, and women when you want. But when he wasn't studying the blood and veins of bats in the university research lab, he chose scotch and women. After the two Macaw brothers adopted him, the Quinault gave him a spot on the beach to park his trailer. Mornings now, he drinks in waves, a thousand to start. At the Tohola Reservation fish house, he runs his hands over the catch, scales gleaming in a failed fishing season. His two brothers in day-long hangovers while their sister keeps the stories and songs alive. The old ways still are good, Dorma tells him, but they don't work when people straddle two waves without a boat. You can have friends who want and friends who give, the professor says. And if you find one who gives more than wants, you count yourself lucky. Four. Day and night and fire were gifts from Frog, who suggested a fast runner could make it to Huckleberry Mountain, catch a spark, bring it home. Bear would wake to February, month the Kittitas called Wak Wakus, sound of frog. Five, Norma knows legs gone diabetic, fingers arthritic. She knows how to cook salmon with sorrel and why the coho were always last to leave their village for the mouth of the skeena. She reads auras, fans them out like fishing nets for the signs. She's deaf to the gashes of her own orange and blue thistle spikes. Oh, dreams so far away, she whispers, heal thyself. She waves sage grass, her wheelchair running a singular track. She remembers frog, but it is November. Six. Eagle that used to sit watching from the top of the deadwood at the bend of the creek doesn't come anymore. Perhaps his wife died and he asked Coyote to lead him to the land of mist. Coyote had warned at the halfway point, but Eagle learned hard. Clay is clay, wood is wood, spirit is smoke. Seven, chants and drums when Kurt dies, healing cloak around Norma's shoulders. 
She waits a year in the old tradition, rents a boat to go to Shai Shai, where she drops a wreath in the sea in the old way. May his spirit rest. An eagle circles, a whale. Eight. Chinook said raven and mink argued, should rivers run straight or bend? One story awarded raven who was loudest. Others said beaver had taken the great chasms that hairy creatures made long ago with their long bows and filled them with water. Nine, now there is fire. Stories change, that is their nature like creek and riverbeds. 10, some say the newest story is true. Some say legend. Newcomer like a child, her hands outstretched as if she were embracing the sun or the waves. Some say it was the great spirit speaking. She takes off her shoes. Some say moccasins. She takes off her dress on this blustery February day. Some say March. What is certain, she does not flinch in the bite of the cold Pacific that sailors fear. Maybe th she thinks she is a boat, the sun a harbor. She just keeps walking. 11. No one will say if there were drums and chants for Norma. She had smoothed the medicine shawl from her tribe across her knees. No dream of who will wear it next and locked it in the cupboard. Never mind the tectonic plates, they're slipping and sliding. Investors find their way. South of the reservation, after Moclips and Pacific Beach, before Copalis, after the trees are logged, a new town rises, incorporated. Half a million starting price. 13. Tourists find their way south. Some stop at the Quinault Casino to try their luck. Hares and cherries whirl in the smoke under the ceiling cameras. The plates follow their own god. 14. Beaver Creek changes its course, gurgles around rocks, trucked in to keep the hillside, ruffles back in with the tide, back to the moss-draped trees and pebbled bed. And I'll close with these two recent poems. Neurons, metal, seed. I understand how neurons fire, human race at stake, how men can smell a woman ovulating, a woman can sniff a cotton ball and know the man's immune system, his odds, fighting, bacteria, and depression. I get how a neuron plugs into a machine. The technician puts synapses into a metal arm strapped to a monkey who learns to reach for an apple. And a paralyzed woman thinks, pick up a glass of water with her metal arm. She drinks, she smiles. I can even catch the idea of a monkey on one coast thinking about an apple or tennis ball, reaching with its robotic arm, while a monkey on the other coast, monkey brain to monkey brain over the internet, reaches for the apple or tennis ball. What I don't get is how ovulation long gone, sprouting of any seed impossible, how when a penis rises and the vagina rains, for the pure pleasure of it. Yes, how, in a fallow winter, it can be like spring, even if it's a spring that won't grow flowers. And the last, the cello. There's a river in there and a jumping frog that knows the taste of wells. There's an occasional gator and coffin or two one of the coffins knowing how deep the ground goes. There's a boat that wants a crossing. There's a cello singing the sap, trees talking 
to the old rocks, foxes, and the river, with rapids and pools, and a well-worn boat that thinks it's a fish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. It was a delight to listen to your work. It's so full of life, so populated with the animals of the Northwest, and so full of mourning at the same time. And I really feel very moved and want to thank you so much for writing them and for sharing them. Thank you. And now, and we're going to move on to our second reader, who is Kelly Aganon. And I'm going to read her bio. Kelly Russell Agadon's newest book is Dialogues with Rising Tides from Coppers Canyon Press. She is the author of four collections of poems, two books of poetry prompts, and she co-edited the first ebook anthology of women's poetry, Fire on Her Tongue. Kelly is the co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press, which you'll note Susan Langraff published with, where she works as an editor and book cover designer, as well as the co-director of Poets on the Coast, a weekend retreat for women. She lives in a sleepy seaside town in the Pacific Northwest, where she is an avid paddleboarder and hiker. You can write to her directly at kellyagadon.com or visit her website, agadon.com. I did forget to say that you can visit Susan at her Facebook page, which is Facebook slash Susan Langraff, or you can find her on poetryfoundation.org. So thank you both. Thank you so much, Sheila, for that. And Susan, what a beautiful reading. I'm holding Susan's book, The Inspired Poet. Um, if you like to teach poetry or you like prompts, um, it's an incredible resource and it's a beautiful cover to the artwork, not what I designed. That sounded like I was complimenting myself because I do the covers. Um, but Susan was a fantastic author to work with. And just in general, as you know, she's probably one of the most generous um, and loving people out there. So I'm honored to read with her and thank you all for putting this together for us. Um, I am going to be reading some poems from not as many that are marked, but from this book called Dialogues with Rising Tides that just came out um, in April uh, the 27th. It, it feels like it's been around for a while because I've done a lot of readings, um, but it really hasn't been. It's a brand new book. So it's interesting. What I've noticed about myself is I haven't been reading certain books and poems in here because, um, you know, there are some challenging topics I deal with, but I'm trying to make every reading new and fresh. So I don't want to keep reading the same poems. So I will be reading new poems. And that's what I was kind of struggling with tonight is what to read. So I decided to let Susan's reading inform mine. And the first poem I'm going to read responds to Susan's idea of um, writing from place. Um, oh, and this is from Copper Canyon from a Port Townsend bookstore, and they have it up at um, Imprint Books. Um, and our place, if you're in our local community, which I noticed so many of you are, is so um, just rich with images. Like today I um, came home and in front of my driveway in a garbage can was a prawn, just a giant dead prawn. And I'm thinking, well, that's fun and unusual, um, but it is rich with images. And uh, there's a lot of water around me and I, and to write about it, and I tend to title a book about it. So I'm going to start with a poem for me that's very much about place, um, and it's called What I Call Erosion. Today's sea seems tired of stealing acres of sand from the beach. What I call erosion, the waves call I wish the wind would stop rushing us. I wish we could just take it slow. In the beauty of white caps, I sometimes see sadness. Sometimes how lucky we are to watch the sunset one more time. There's so much we're carrying these days. An osprey clutches a fish in its talons. 
A killdeer runs across the dunes, trying to distract us from its nest. Danger, even when it's not, is everywhere. Sometimes I pretend to have a broken wing as I look out the window, but then a cloudscape in a world of buffle heads, of saltwater roses, and I forget fear. It's 7 a.m. on a Thursday, and an otter is pretending none of my concerns matter. The otter, if laughter were a mammal, dives in and out of the waves playful. When the planet says, this is impossible, the otter responds, only if you believe it. So I noticed my friend, um, Susan Rich is in the um, audience. So I wanted to read a poem. Um, where Susan, Susan and I have, well, did have writing dates in person um, before the pandemic. And she said, write about something that made you really angry. And this poem will be coming out or if it hasn't come out already in Meridian, but it's the first time I'm ever reading it. So um, we'll see how that goes. It, it feels for me a little bit of a, of a risk, but I think it's something to share. Uh, the poem is called, After Discovering My Husband Bought a Handgun. I said nothing as you found a mistress and filled her with bullets, hid her in the laundry room when I came home. How could I know there was another? I was aimed at our future an anniversary without bullet wounds. You're not the first man to believe betrayal is beautiful. You promised me nothing, said gun was your new passport, your new itinerary, said gun is the lock we, we never had on our doors, said it's a dangerous world now, gun will keep us safe, said gun gives good dead, gun to my head, Gun in my bed. Gun lets you do things to her when she is loaded. Said gun is a lover you always wanted. It's always gun. It's always fun to have a new lover. So I slid my fingers around her thin neck and pulled hard. Man, I should have ended with that one. Um. <laughs> You need to have friends around you who make you write things that are hard to write. Um, so thank you, Susan. Um, I love that I have friends that make me write poems I didn't know I was going to write or needed to write. Come on, I'll take a breath. Okay. The next poem I'm going to read is a little lighter. Um, and it reminds me that you can get titles from poems uh, just about anywhere. This title is from a Madewell sweatshirt I saw. It's called, The Sun Doesn't Know It's a Star. We live in a world where every season begins with a bullet exiting a shadow and someone praying for her lilacs for her honeysuckle to take root. It's a hundred degrees in the shade and the weather argues with itself over who has the better candidate. Stop, you're both wrong. The sky wins by a meteor shower. The stars aren't watching television tonight. They're out waltzing through modern galaxies, a ballroom of ghosts, where everything is about daybreak and dazzle, how much moon dust will trail into the house. Somewhere between ego and starshine, we lost our hat box of kindness. Maybe we stored it in the back closet because fear seems so much dramatic on the living room table. 
and we wonder why we think our neighbors a spy and everyone is so on edge. Some days the stranger planting honeysuckle to stabilize the cliff leans too far into the galaxy and we fall into her optimism. Trust what you don't know, like the honeybees that rise from the heart of the canyon. Watch them like small circling suns, the slight blossoms. Watch them slide in, knowing even a small amount of nectar is a greater sum than none. So in the pandemic, I don't, I've been noticing people have been getting puppies and I want a dog so bad, but this is the first time in my life I haven't had a dog. My golden retriever passed away. Um, I'm thinking it's five years. I've kind of, I never wanted to remember the year or the date. Um, it's hard when a dog gets old and you have to um, deal with their aging bodies, any pet. Um, they love you so unconditionally. So this poem is about my dog, whose name was Betty Holly, but for the book, because I have lots of Fitzgerald and Zelda Fitzgerald references in here, he got named Gatsby. And I like to think that's to protect my dog's privacy. So the poem is called Waltz with Gatsby at 3 a.m. If only sleep could help me sweep up the confetti on the staircase or what it really is, shredded cabbage on the kitchen porch. There's an old dog limping in the yard and he's my old dog. Bless the sweet fo fog he roams through and call that sweet fog God or grass or indeterminate years. In the physical world, we are just bodies losing our structure, our structure. My composition from breadstick to cinnamon loaf, honeycomb to just a drip of honey. Gatsby has changed from dog in the waves, dog in the field, to dog needing help when his back legs don't hold. We're all trying my dog slowly returning to the blue smoke he came from, while I chop cabbage and watch the moon begin its slow circle into another time zone. In my head, I'm Zelda, and this is my party. But the truth is, it's almost morning. The truth is, I'm just the worker bee and not the queen. I wish dogs live longer. That's, that could have been the poem. Dogs should live longer. So I'm gonna finish up um, with a couple poems. And I'm always interested in learning new words. And I learned this word Winter Sirig, which is Old English and translates, in, translates into winter sorrow or winter sadness. Um, and I was just really taken by that because I can get sad in winter. Um, and I thought, oh, there's kind of a beautiful world, word for sad, for that sadness. Um, I think that's about all you need to know. It's called Winter, winter Sirig Waltz. I add three cups of powdered sugar to the angel food cake. Made with real angels, I say to the shadows. The water spider in the measuring cup does the backstroke. The snow you shoveled in the driveway holds us captive. I lick my fingers and stroke a blessing across my tongue. We are all achieving, we're all achieving things these days. You ask me if waltzing should be taught in school instead of physics. When I respond, 
what doesn't move us forward becomes part of the problem. We know this is us and the economy. I am the snowball wishing you were the supernova and you are a supernova wishing I'd lower my expectations. Later, when I add gin to the devil's food cake, the devil removes his muzzle. The cat peers into the kitchen and sees a ghost, which I am these days, as well as a devil. You and the cat wish I were baking pumpkin pie and we were happier, but my dessert is a forgotten dance, a shot of something in my drink. Sometimes after I stop crying, the moon places its hands around my hips. We're cool, I say, and roll over to my other lover, Pillow, my other lover, Murmur, my other lover, a newly discovered word. You were the first to hear that one out loud. You were the first audience for that. So thank you for um, being there. Um, and Susan mentioned that, you know, she read one of her longer poems. So I'm going to read one of uh, the longer poems um, towards the end of the book. Um, I've, it's been fun to read the reviews that have been coming out because they'll say the book is really dark but offers hope. And I, I always hope that I'm offering hope. Um, and this one was another poem that was a Zelda Fitzgerald inspired and also my poor memory. Um, I remembered the quote she wrote as we could go on indefinitely being swept off of our feet. But the actual quote is we couldn't go on indefinitely being swept off our feet. So that became the title. I don't believe in perfection or that the metal detector will find my lost wedding ring or the silver fish bracelet I dropped while dancing in a corner of a continent where responsibilities were tropical drinks. But you could count yourself a hero or maybe the luckiest person in the world if you made it home safely without slicing your foot on the metal steps to the beach. These days, I believe people will fall asleep in moments we need them to be awake for us. And we will be judged for something we never thought of. I trust the thirst we feel is trying to tell us something if we listen to it. And people will forget to wear sunblock and my skin will tire and wrinkle and I'll be so Georgia O'Keeffe about it saying, Love me for my lines, for the life I led, because the future is a boiling pot of water. The future is a misspelled world. Today, I cried when I read about a dolphin caught in a net. Something I forget still happens, but hush. Today's storm is not as severe as the meteorologists report. And yes, the news is run by men who look in the mirror and make finger guns at their reflections thinking, this is living, baby. Though maybe living is watching less TV and trying not to fall on a friend's sandcastle. It seems we always have our fingers in each other's dirt. Occasionally the rain stops and the sun becomes a luxury to anyone with my zip code. And from my beach chair, I really believe I can hear the buzzing of someone in another country setting down their metal detector and reaching their hand to pick up my silver bracelet and diamond ring, believing they are the luckiest person on earth.
Thank you all for listening tonight. I appreciate it. I hope you heard the birds screech by my window. Kelly, thank you so much. Your words remind us, your poems remind us to take risks, which is what poetry is for, I think, and to follow the words to where they go, and also to bring what you call the daylight and dazzle into even the dark. So thank you so much. And as we close the reading, I want to remind you to look at the chat because there's Holly's been posting the uh, publishers and names of our poets' books. And also there's wonderful comments there to the poets about their words and poems. So I wanna thank Kelly and Susan for your extraordinary work and for sharing it with us. I wanna thank George and Centrum for their help in co-sponsoring as well as Northwind Art for partnering with us to keep the series going. And to all of you, of course, who have attended. And you can support the poets, as we've said, by buying their books. And um, you can find them at the Imprint Bookstore or Open Books or almost anywhere, Copper Canyon directly. Um, and you can get information from their websites. And I want you to know about some upcoming uh, readings, which we still think will be online. June 17th will be a recorded reading of uh, people who have published in this uh, year's Tide Pools. The contributors will be reading and they'll be editing. They'll be recording themselves and being edited together into a wonderful presentation. And on July 22nd brings the Center and Foundation uh, Port Townsend Writers Conference reading. And on August 19th, and who knows, maybe we'll be back in person. There will be our ekphrastic reading, which is made of contributors who have looked at the artwork either online or at the Northwind Art Gallery and um, written in response to what they see there in their selected artwork. So if you'd like to be added to our mailing list and you haven't been, you can uh, find it at northwindart.org. And you can also just email us directly at n windreaders at gmail.com. So as I close this out, I just want to say again, thank you to everybody. Poetry brings so much to us and it's such a joy to be able to share it, even in this way. It creates such a wonderful intimacy and I feel very enriched. So thank you again so very much. <laughs>